Um, well, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming to uh, the Peace House. Uh, and we have a extremely special treat. So, those of you who I know, some people have come a distance. I think it'll be worth it. Uh, tonight we have uh, Kamuda, also known as Sharon Janis. She's an Emmy Award-winning filmmaker, and she's got several books on spirituality for dummies and the secrets of spiritual success. And if you type Happiness. Pil ha yeah. and if you type uh, Peace Pilgrim into YouTube, you'll see some of the uh, videos that she's made. She's the archivist for the Friends of Peace Pilgrim, so she has uh, all of the film that's known of her. So what she's done for us tonight is to gone through that and picked out um, clips. I think it's about 45 minutes of clips that she'll talk about. And uh, some of these have not been seen by the general public before. Um, at the end, too, there are books that came from the Friends of Peace Pilgrim, little pamphlets and books. And uh, the pamphlet, everyone should take one. If you will actually read the book, you can have that, too, okay, without being. There is a basket for donations if you want but it's not uh, necessary. So I'm going to turn over to Kamuda, and uh, she'll, have, she'll introduce herself a lot more. Pose. Namaste. Namaste. I've been wanting to do a Peace Pilgrim event for a long time, so this is very special um, for me to do. This is the map of her walks. That she would keep in her pocket wow. and mark up. And uh, she kept track up to 25,000 miles, very meticulously. And then after that, she stopped counting. Okay. Uh, I had written to Peace Pilgrim Foundation. Their website is peacepilgrim.com, and uh, I think also .org. And they will send uh, anybody who requests one a book, videos, audio, and they don't ask, just like she didn't ask for money or food, or she took a vow to fast until someone offered her food. In the same way, they just send it out, and then whatever donations come in, keep it going. Uh, and they've been doing this for, you know, I think, a couple decades now. Wow. So I had asked them to send uh, some books and, and, uh, and the smaller pamphlets, and. They sent more than I asked for, of course, <laughs> with love and with a smile. And you know, I put up the note they sent, which was very sweet also. Um, and they're following her, her way. Uh, someone asked Peace Pilgrim once, why don't you accept money? Because you couldn't give her money. She said, because I talk about spiritual truth, and spiritual truth should never be sold. Try telling that to <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> uh, she said, those who sell it injure themselves spiritually. She's, you know, she's a little extreme, but then again, she said it like she understands it. Uh, she said, um, the money that comes in the mail without being solicited, I do not use for myself. I use it for printing and postage. You know, she would answer people's letters a lot. And she had a little newsletter eventually that, um, that would get sent out to people, again, on request, without asking for anything. So when people did send money um, to her post office, that's where it went. She said, those who attempt to buy spiritual truth are trying to get it before they are ready. Isn't that interesting? She said, uh, in this wonderfully well-ordered universe, when they are ready, it will be given. And that actually was my experience. Like Peace Pilgrim, I was brought up atheist. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the middle of college, I took um, a course with a professor who took us on a field trip to the local ashram, mm -hmm. which I thought, ooh, weird, you know. <laughs> I hope they don't think I'm going to join some weird cult and uh, ended up spending the next 10 years in Muktananda's ashram in upstate New York, where I made the videos and milked the cows. <laughs> so that's really an example of what she said. I was ready. I didn't know it. I wasn't looking for it. And it came on my path. In fact, the chapter in my memoir about that is called When the Student is Ready, from the quote, When the student is ready, the guru appears. So I love that her legacy lives on so beautifully through this foundation 
where they keep sending in her way. Um, and so it's nice to be able to offer this event in the same, in the same way. Uh, her message, Peace Pilgrim's message, and her example were very in harmony with many different religions. And that's why when I first found out about her, first of all, I wanted to make a video. <laughs> it's my first uh, thing when I get inspired. And, uh, and then second of all, I, I, I watched her example and her teachings, and they were so in harmony with all different religions and all different uh, teachings. Um, even her main message was overcome evil with good and falseness with true, truth and hatred with love. Which, if you really explore it, is very profound and multifaceted. It's personal, it's universal, it's on a you know, global scale. And, of course, that's uh, the Bible. In Romans 12, 21 says, Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And when she was young, she, had, uh, she was brought up, like I said, atheist. But she was brought up in a family that loved peace and that you know, discussed world events. And she discovered early on the, the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you. And it just struck her. She just really got it. And, and she wanted to live by that. And it, she ended up translating it into different versions, such as if you want to have friends, you have to be friendly. And then eventually, if you want to make peace, you must be peaceful. And of course, I, I don't know if you've seen them, but I've seen some peace activists who weren't that peaceful. <laughs> so, you know, it's a wonderful, she, and, and she lived that, of course, she was very peaceful, but she also didn't hold back in her assessments about war and her concerns. You know, she wasn't just only flowery, as you'll see, and I'll share some kind of quotes from her. And, uh, you know, her, her story is just full of lessons and treasures. Yet she wore this blue tunic with white letters that said, Peace Pilgrim. And on the back, it, originally it said, uh, Walking Coast to Coast for World Dis uh, Disarmament. And then it changed to 25,000 Miles for Peace. And she, uh, you know, when, you, when you're wearing that, people would come up to her and ask her about herself. So she said it was just a wonderful way to meet people. She didn't have to approach them. They would approach her. And of course, in the 1950s, she started in 1953, uh, you know, women wearing pants and <laughs> walking by themselves across the country, of course, was very unusual. And, um, and she was very friendly. She was vivacious. You, you know, you wanted to talk to her when you saw her. Um, and, and, you know, it's like when swamis wear a robe also. There's that idea of it helps keep you in the Dharma. You know, you're... you're represent more than just your fallible self, um, which she had transcended to some degree, but it helps keep you there, you know. Of course, and some, some swamis or people in robes, they go home and they, you know, go back to their place and who knows, you know, some may do things that aren't as dharmic, but she was on the road. She had nowhere to go to. <laughs> there were no closed doors for her. And, um, and she took her own vow which is very powerful, you know, people take different vows in their life for different religions um, and traditions, but this was from within. This is just, she was guided to do this. She had this freedom, but she actually imposed much stricter conditions and rules than, you know, almost anybody would have. I mean, she, she started walking at age 44 in January 1st, 1953 at the... Uh, Rose Parade in Los Angeles. And she walked ahead of the parade and she had pamphlets she was handing out and she wanted people to sign the petition um, that she was going to take to Washington, D.C. And she was going to walk from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. So she, I don't think she had any idea she was going to you know, do this for 28 years. You know, but then she did and she took a vow. She would say, I've, I've taken a vow that I will remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace, fasting until given food, and walking until given shelter. And she'd say, I do not ask, it must be offered. And that's the power of faith. 
if you really have faith, people will come and offer you because it's God coming through everybody. And she would bring out this goodness in people. And, you know, if you have this aura around you of truth and faith, then that, it just spreads around you, it carries you, your reality comes into that. And she, I mean, she walked around all different communities. She walked through every city that had at least 10,000 people in it, and many that had fewer, and she um, walked across the country, I think, eight times, and also into Canada. Um, she went down to Hawaii once, but I think she flew there. <laughs> she gave a little retreat. Uh, that some friends of mine run. And, you know, she really lived to see God in each other, which my guru was, and Muktananda, would, and that was one of his main teachings, to see God in each other, and she really did. She saw God in each other. And I, I love the, the vow, and, you know, there's a Sufi poem I love that also describes her. Banish this cup of worldly wine from my sight. I have not taken a vow to abstain from drinking, but you have not lowered your eyes, and your intoxicating glance fills me so completely that it leaves no room for any mortal mind. And that was what, what she was fueled with, the, that enthusiasm that she didn't take a vow, but she took her own vow. She didn't take an outer vow. The, the verse sounds like this when it's sung. And she walked anonymous. She hid her previous name. Um, and she wanted people to focus on her message, you know, not her past, not where she came from. And, you know, in general, if somebody takes such an extreme step, chances are they had some difficulty in their life that helped them become a ren renunciant. <laughs> and she did. She, there were some challenges. She had married a fellow who uh, wasn't quite at her level of consciousness. It was a physical attraction, and they married very quickly. Uh, they eloped, actually, and uh, her family wasn't thrilled about that. Uh, and, you know, he ended up... Well, he, his, he was having trouble with his job, and he passed some bad checks, and it reflected badly on her father, who was, uh, wanted to be a judge. <laughs> so there was a real challenge, and then he was in a, the father was in a car accident, and I think all that really helped, even though it's traumas, it's problems, it's terrible, that helped propel her and free her from the whole past. She was able to let go of it. You know, if you have a very comfortable life, it's uh, sometimes harder to grow spiritually, and sometimes you have some big challenge, and you have a leap of growth, and uh, and that's that's what she did. Of course, today if she was walking, we'd have TMZ finding out who she was, <laughs> or the National Enquirer, you know. <laughs> so, but at the time, uh, all the articles um, just showed uh, you know this anonymous pilgrim. So I think we'll show this. The uh, music video I put together just for this event. She called herself Peace Pilgrim. She walked this land for peace. Over 25,000 miles she walked along with no possessions but the clothes upon her back. She called herself Peace Pilgrim 
legacy of simplicity and love Every step she took was for this world we're dreaming of Powered by an inner strength that comes from above, from above She said I shall remain that most people don't know who she is, or was. I mean, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. Hopefully we're going to change that, and hopefully this will be the beginning of some, some of the sparks that are uh, going to help bring her back into the public consciousness, because we certainly need her message today as much as we did uh, when she gave it. Now, when she started her pilgrimage, the Korean War was going on, uh, McCarthyism was happening, so it really took a special bravery for her to step out so boldly, and you saw the newspaper articles, uh, there were hundreds of them. She was a one-person PR <laughs> team. She would call the newspapers, and she uh, eventually she would meet people, and so when she'd walk through again, she, she'd stay with them, and she would have appearances planned at churches and, you know, radio stations, things like that, and so she would ask the um, people, you can put the map back. Um, and so she would have people who, you know, who knew she was going to come also. She'd tell them who to call. So she wasn't just a mindless uh, pilgrim. <laughs> you know, she, uh, she was really a one-person uh, PR team. And um, the initial spark came during a walk she took in the woods. And you'll see in this clip, it starts with her niece mentioning how she was the first woman ever, you know, recorded, who walked the entire Appalachian Trail. And so it's just this wonderful demonstration of how the universe uses what you like to do and what you are good at doing and finds a way for that to become service. She was actually the first woman ever to hike the uh, entire Appalachian Trail. And I know she used to, when she was in those hiking days, she'd always bring home a couple of like people that she hiked with, you know, sort of stray people. She'd always pick up stray people all over the place. Maybe there were people she was sort of helping. She used to, you know, just talk to a lot of people. Before a life can be in harmony, it must be in harmony with 
its part in God's plan. You know, every one of us has a unique part in God's plan, which we cannot learn from without, which we must learn from within. And therefore, if you do not yet know clearly where you fit into God's plan, seek it in receptive silence. of a feeling of deep seeking for a meaningful way of life, I began to walk one night through the woods with the feeling that I would continue to walk until I found what I was seeking. And after I had walked almost all night, I came out into a clearing where the moonlight was shining down. And I found myself saying, if you can use me for anything, please use me. And I found myself feeling, here I am, take all of me, use me as you will, I withhold nothing. And then, of course, I felt I had found what I was seeking. I experienced the complete willingness without any reservations whatsoever to give my life to something beyond myself. But then I discovered that there is a great difference between the willingness to give and the actual giving. In my life, 15 years lay between. So during those 15 years, she got divorced. She started working with uh, peace organizations, you know, seeking how she could serve, and she would volunteer. And she describes that she had a struggle between her lower self and her higher self. Because um, it brings some light to it. Yeah. Kind of double, double purpose. <laughs> Thanks. Um, she describes the struggle she had between the self-centered nature and the God-centered nature, which is the awareness of the whole. And so during that time, she even draws a chart in some of her lectures of the ups and downs, the hills and the valleys, and you get to this plateau and you don't come down from there, but you still have ups and downs there, and then you hit, and then you kind of hit a, a place where you, you don't really go back to the self-centered nature. And um, so that's, that was what she did. And welcome. And so I'm going to play uh, another clip, or Benai is going to play another clip of Peace Pilgrim's closest friend and confidant, number four, uh, Richard Billings, who she Her actually. Whole concept so, about religion. Um, about yeah. He, um, she kind of helped inspire him to become a minister. And from the time she met him, you'll see a little bit later, she uh, knew him from a past lifetime. <laughs> and they became very close friends. And for her, you know, she walked, <coughs> she walked and met so many people. And this is, again, the 50s, 60s. I mean, people didn't have the expanded yoga consciousness we have today. And in Richard, she found someone she could talk to about all the things that were going on. And she'd keep him up late into the night and she'd apologize, like, I'm really sorry. I have to. She says, I have to share all these things with somebody. And uh, she even left him her special writings and told him to, you know, use, that he was welcome to use them in his talks and things like that. And he felt that his philosophy um, was very much based on what he learned from her. Uh, he's still alive and he was the he's been the longest serving unity minister in history <laughs> her whole concept about religion about life which she at one time i'm sure you're aware was lived very comfortably but was not happy had what she said the world would call success uh, what the world would think of as having it made, so to speak. But this unrest in her soul 
And then she had this vision, this calling to do this walking for peace. And um, she had the struggle inside of herself because she said, why would I leave this? She obviously had beautiful gardens around her home and she loved flowers. But she said, why would I leave this to, to impoverish myself? And she thought, but am I not impoverished where I am? I'm not a happy woman. I'm not what you would call a peaceful woman. My life is full of unrest. I'll give it a try. And then as she began to walk, she realized that she was richer than she had known because she wasn't attached to anything. There was nothing that she felt she couldn't give up or let go of. And she said, Richard, it was like, just shaking loose shackles of lifetimes to know this great freedom of not being bound with things. Amazing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In uh, Indian philosophy, there's a term vairagya, which is dispassion, renunciation. And that's the freedom that you get from having, you know, Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> so, uh, you know, taking a vow is, is one thing. The actual practice of the vow, of course, brings a lot of different challenges. And, you know, she met, like I said, all kinds of people. Some doubted her, some, you know, understood what she was saying. Some wanted to understand what she was saying. There's, you know, taking a vow and then there's the actual practice of it. For example, uh, for many years I was a very strict vegetarian. And it sounds easy enough when you're living in an ashram for 10 years, which I did, <laughs> and they're cooking your delicious vegetarian meals that are balanced with the protein and the rice and everything's just right. Uh, and then when I'd go out, when I moved to Hollywood, where I would be invited to you know, director's homes for a little dinner party and this and that, and you have to be in this total pain. <laughs> you know, what, what's the base of the soup made of? <laughs> you know, it's just the practice of taking a vow. And then you have to consider, well, is that the most important vow for me? You know? And Peace Pilgrim was vegetarian. Uh, but that's one of the contrasts that we're going to actually get to in a few minutes. When she was young, her sister said uh, she didn't eat vegetables hardly at all. The only vegetables she would ever eat were green beans. She was a meat eater. And that's just one of many things in her life that transformed, you know? Um, so, it, and then, like, Patanjali Yoga Sutras talks about if you take a vow of being truthful, whether it's an active vow or it's just something naturally that you are guided to do, or you don't feel comfortable saying anything that's not truth, then the result of that, according to Patanjali Yoga Sutras, is for one who increasingly practices honesty or truthfulness in actions, speech, and thoughts, his or her will is naturally fulfilled. And it's like your speech becomes more powerful from that vow, from the austerity of, of honesty. And I've experienced that too, because I, I find it easier to be honest. <laughs> Uh, and then your words have more fruit. You can give a blessing, and it actually means something. Your words actually do have a more impact in, in the world around you. Uh, but then telling the truth doesn't always make a lot of friends. <laughs> right? There was an old I Love Lucy episode where they were playing a card game with Lucy and, and the girls. And at one point they decided they were going to just tell the truth, say what they really thought without any filters, and by the end of the game, they were all very mad at each other. <laughs> so you have to find, and she had that balance too, you know. Um, we'll have a, a clip with a friend of Peace Pilgrims who, who uh, hosted her and was asking her about, uh, okay. You can play that right now. Let's see, this is Aline. Wait, is number five? No, I'll tell you in a second which one it is. It's uh, number eight. We're going out of order. Uh, this is uh, Aline Gray who hosts her. She's a real character, this Aline. <laughs> and she talks about, um, you know, when she told Peace Pilgrim, asked her what she wanted to order for dinner. <laughs> 
Tell me more about Peace Pilgrim. She stayed in your house? Yes, and of course she's a vegetarian, you know. And I said, are there any special orders uh, for, for your, uh, your food intake? What would you like me to do? She says, I don't give orders. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was cute because it was kind of a thing with me. I'm, I'm the one that gives orders. It was like a, a little retort, you know, that, that she, don't you know that you're the one that gives the orders? <laughs> and, but so uh, uh, she stayed in my, in my front bedroom, which is now my art, little art studio in my library. But um, so I told her something I was going to make. And I, I made her. I made her my favorite salad. I'm so, so glad she didn't frown on it because it's that uh, uh, salad with um, uh, cottage cheese. And I asked her if that was okay, and she said, "Well, yes. In this case, it's okay." <laughs> anyway, so I, I fixed her my salad with cottage cheese and nuts and fruits and all kinds of things. It was a gelatin. It had gelatin. Well, the, that was a, the problem. I asked her about the gelatin, and she said, it, "She said." Those things, those little things, are not that important. And I thought that was nice to say. So, so there's a few lessons in that little clip. Um, one, of course, is, you know, you can be flexible. You, don't, you have to choose what's important in life, first things first. And whether she ate gelatin, you know, like, as Jesus said, what goes in is not as important as what comes out of your mouth. <laughs> so I think she understood that, and um, and one thing I, I liked about it, it reminded me of the guru, where she felt kind of busted a little bit, like all Peace Pilgrim said was, I don't give orders, and because uh, Aline was in this higher consciousness from being in her company, she was able to read within that a message, whether Peace Pilgrim even intended it or not, consciously, but this happened around the guru all the time, where you know it, it made her do some introspection, and uh, and it probably made her you know change some of her ways and not be quite as uh, ordering uh, people about. <clears throat> so when she began the, the peace pilgrimage, the three peace petitions she carried were um, to have immediate peace in Korea. Uh, the establishment of a national peace department, which Marianne Williamson is still trying to get, and other people. And she directed the third to the United Nations, seeking freedom for the world from the burden of armaments, and in its stead, the furthering of world prosperity. Now, wouldn't it have been nice if yeah. those things had, had happened? Yeah. Uh, eventually, of course, the Korea War did end, but then, as I was getting ready to come here today, this is how, when you're working on a great beings project, a lot of magic happens. And uh, I turned on the TV uh, while I was getting ready, and I'm always looking for a message for something, you know, maybe they see something that will inspire. And it happened to be on CNN, and they were doing a, a show about this war in the 60s. War in the 1960s. <laughs> and they showed the numbers and how they had originally gone just to protect some airspace and sent a small number of troops. Then, you know, once you get into war, as we've discovered over and over again, it's just more and more and more. And that's what she was trying to teach. And, uh, you know, it would be nice if at some point we, her message and what we've learned and, uh, and uh, observed, even right now in Iraq, is like war, it doesn't seem to quite work. There, there might be some better ways to approach uh, world issues. And, um, you know, she didn't fit in, try to fit into ideas of how a spiritual person should be, or how a woman at that time should be. Uh, she, here was one of the poems that she wrote. She, she didn't always have flowery language. Sometimes she did, but um, this is an example of one of the poems that was in her, one of her newsletters. While she'd walk, she would just come up with these things and jot them down. And uh, she said, in days long past, when men were mere barbarians, they chose a man, or maybe two, to die as sacrifices to the storm god Thor. But now that they are civilized and Christians, they choose a million men or two to die as sacrifices to the stern god War. Um, so now we're going to see clip number nine, which is, uh, don't play it until it's 
until I explain what it is. Um, you're going to see John and Ann Rush. This is a couple. They're, they're gone now. But they started the Friends of Peace Pilgrim Foundation. They were friends of hers. And uh, they're Quakers. And they're going to talk about the tunic she wore and where she kept all of her worldly possessions. And I'm going to hold this so the, so the viewer can, can see it. And then, uh, now can you, I'll show this side first, and then I want to turn this around, Tom, so we can get the back of it, 25,000 miles on foot for peace. And can you, can you uh, point to the pockets okay. there on, on the tunic? Mm -hmm. I, I trust you can see that, that's mm -hmm. right. Put your hand inside. That's, that's fine. This is now, where she kept all of her worldly... All of her worldly possessions were kept in the pockets of this tunic. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. There was uh, incredible. A, uh, a folding toothbrush, a ballpoint pen, her uh, current mail, and uh, maybe a map. Uh, maybe. Maybe a maybe. map maybe. Of, the, of the area. There's a movie in the works about Peace Pilgrim. <coughs> and the fellow who's, uh, who wrote the script, his name is Mark Skelton, he's a filmmaker. And a few years ago he contacted me, and because and, uh, he based a lot of it on the documentary, and asked if I wanted to see the script. And a few years earlier some other guy tried to write a script and, was, you know, it was not quite it. And I thought, oh, another script, you know. <laughs> and then I read it, and the first paragraph, I saw it on the screen the very beginning, the first shot, which was, a, I'll tell you, I hope, it's, I hope you won't mind, a hand sewing the letters. Aww. Oh, right? And, and then I worked with him. We actually rewrote a lot of the script. Um, so from there she walks out uh, and to the parade. And uh, there's a great scene in the, in the movie script. <laughs> Uh, that takes place at, at one point, you know, it was McCarthyism and the communism and all that was, was going on at the time. And so they had gotten some complaints and reports that this woman's walking around talking about peace. Ooh. <laughs> and even her, some of her neighbors back home wrote into the FBI. We have the FBI files. <laughs> Those neighbors always <laughs> have to do stuff like that. And uh, so, that, which is one reason she also walked anonymous. She didn't want it to be a burden for her family, what she was doing. And at one point, J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover heard of her. And he wanted her to be questioned. So he directed two of his agents to pick her up on the road, find out where she was, pick her up on the road, and they could um, arrest her for vagrancy and bring her in for questioning and find out what's going on with this lady. <clears throat> so they find her walking on the road and say, we're going to bring you in. And of course, for her, it was just more people she could share her message with. <laughs> and uh, she said, OK. She said, but can I, I'd like to make an X on the road here because I'm counting miles. So when we're done, if you could bring me back to the same spot, <laughs> then I can mark it on my map and, and continue to count the miles. She was very meticulous about counting the miles. And they brought her to jail, and she made friends with all the women in the holding cell and helped make peace be between the women and the guards who were, you know, at odds. And she took her mug shot with a big smile. <laughs> and the next day, they brought her to the courthouse, and this officer is walking with her, and he had a gun. And she said to him, if I tried to run away, would you shoot me? And he said, no, I never shoot anything I can catch. <laughs> and so here's a, a little part of the script from, uh, from the movie. So the court official says, Presenting Mildred Norman Ryder, Your Honor, charged with vagrancy under Penal Code 464. Peace squirms at the mention of her real name. The judge, how do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. Are you homeless and without means, Mrs. Ryder? Yes, Your Honor, I am also a pilgrim of peace. I don't follow. Well, I walk until given shelter, and I fast until given food. I have no need for money. My pilgrimage is a prayer for world peace. What happens when you're not given food? 
Oh, I rarely skip more than three or four meals in a row. The longest I've been without food is only three days. The body can go much longer, you know. And then the prosecutor said, Your Honor, this woman is obviously deluded. Her only possessions are a toothbrush and a comb. She has no visible means of support. And then I added this line of a, this <laughs> of a spectator, which probably is what happened. The spectator said, you know, maybe she thinks she's a Gandhi. Yeah. And then back to what really happened in, in uh, Peace Pilgrim's reported uh, story. So then the judge actually said, Mrs. Ryder, your vanity surprises me. You know, Gandhi, he probably said Gandhi. <laughs> you know, Gandhi didn't own a toothbrush or a comb on his crusade. And she said, well, yes, that's true, but Gandhi didn't have teeth or hair. <laughs> that's going to so be in the trailer of this movie. And, uh, and while they were questioning her, the clerk came and gave the judge a letter that was from the governor, who it turns out had gone to find Peace Pilgrim a couple days earlier. She was sleeping in a fire truck in a fire station. And the governor wanted to talk to her. He was a fan because there was so much press. Everybody you know had heard about her. A lot of people wanted to meet her. So the governor sent a, had sent a letter, and the judge said, "Well, you are full of surprises. You have friends in high places, Mrs. Ryder. I don't see any point in pursuing this ridiculous charge. If your cause is good enough for Governor Pyle, it's good enough for me. Case dismissed." Uh, <coughs> what state was that? In? Uh, you know, it was in one of the southern states. I think it was Texas, maybe, one of those. One of those. That's, <laughs> obviously, I'm not. <laughs> one of those divine places. <laughs> filled with beings of light. <laughs> well, you know, even Peace, when she was younger, she was very judgmental. Some neighbor kids had stolen something from her family and, and like, buried it a watch or something. And when they found it and found that the kids had had stolen. She said, well, those people. It's not surprising those people would. And, uh, and her sister even says in one interview that, you know, she was kind of prejudiced. But she completely overcame that. And she loved every person. And she stayed with every kind of possible family, every race, every, you know, kind of uh, society. She talked to, from top to bottom, uh, all kinds of people. And, uh, you know, she gives an expanded view of what peace is. People think peace is sitting in a monastery and just meditating and being very docile. And it can be that. But, you know, for her, it was peace in action. And she said, there is such a great need for constructive peace action. And think of how applicable this is today. We live at a crisis period in human affairs. And those of us who are living today face a very momentous decision a choice between nuclear war of annihilation and a golden age of peace. And this was when the atomic bomb was coming out, and, you know, there was a Cold War going on, and we could have really annihilated the planet. You know, which is, she really felt it was a dire uh, situation. She said, all who are living today will help to make this choice, for the tide of world affairs now drifts in the direction of war and destruction. So all who do nothing in this crisis situation are choosing to let it drift. Those who wish to choose peace must act meaningfully for peace and become part of the stirring and awakening which has begun and is accelerating and help to accelerate it sufficiently to turn the tide. In this crisis situation, peace is certainly everybody's business. The time to work for peace is now. And, you know... The truth is, we are in much better shape than we might have been if peace activists hadn't helped to turn that tide already. Um, but, you know, she had opinions. She was a real person. She even had disagreements with God that she told her friend Richard about in number six. Did she describe to you the, um, the vision she had or that shift where she knew that she was to walk the pilgrimage? Well, it came to her clear, but, you know, like most of us, we wrestle with something. Uh, could this be meant for me? Am I really 
qualified? Am I really willing? Am I ready to do this? And she had her struggles, she said about it. Even when she'd be walking and a rainstorm would come up, she'd say, well, surely God, you know, is this really what you want me to do? But she'd say, and I learned from uh, peace to do what I call dialoguing with God. Because she told me, Richard, I have the most wonderful dialogues with God. Sometimes I really argue with him. Sometimes I get mad at him. And once in a while we have a real peaceful conversation. <laughs> but she went through all this stuff. But then she would say, eventually I would start laughing and I'd have a sense of humor about the whole thing and think, okay, God, it's okay. There will be more sun and the rain is not forever. So she really taught me a lot of things and I used that method ever after I met Peace then in dialoguing with God. She said, you do all this counseling and when I'm here, I see these people coming in, unloading all their stuff on you. But she said, Richard, if they would only learn to dialogue with God, you'd, you're your own best counselor. Because you talk to that higher self within you, and your human self, and the two of you talk, you come up with your own answers. And you save an awful lot of money from psychiatry and all of that, because she wasn't much into doctors or psychiatry. And actually, after Peace Pilgrim had her, her big, once she hit that plateau on her chart, she never was sick for the rest of her life. She never even had a cold. Walking out in all the elements. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Are, are we getting to see the chart? No, you'll, but you can go to, you know, on, on YouTube and oh. see her. She has a whole lecture about it. I know, I could only include so much. I already had more than me. <laughs> but it was just, yeah, but it was just a, you know. Did you talk about her astrology chart? No, no, no. It was a chart that she would show in lectures of her growth process, where she started out, you start, start out in the self-centered nature, and then you have little blips of consciousness. And then you kind of hit a certain plateau, and then you still have ups and downs, and then at some point you hit, and that's the basic chart. You hit a higher plateau. Um, but there are quite a few videos of her online, and you can see her lecture about it. Um, now I want to show a clip of Mrs. Shehab. Uh, Mrs. and Mr. Shehab hosted Peace Pilgrim many times in their home. And Mrs. Shehab, you, from her you get the sense of how uh, Peace Pilgrim was such a godsend for women, you know, in the 1950s. They're homemakers, they're stuck, they're, you, know, they, you know, they never even thought of doing anything outside of the norm. And uh, so uh, Mrs. Shehab, you'll hear from her husband later, he's not as thrilled about it. <laughs> and I'm sure they both represent exactly what many, many women and many husbands felt. Uh, so it was really fun to find this footage in the archives. Uh, so here's Mrs. Shehab, and you see, you know, she lights up and says Peace Pilgrim was the highlight of the year when Peace Pilgrim came around. So this is uh, number seven. And she would call up and say, I'm here. Meet me on the steps of the post office downtown. Can you? No, she wouldn't say meet me. You know, uh, I would say, oh, I'll pick you up. I mean, there was immediately... Oh, you're a day early, but I wasn't ready, and so forth, and so there. I would go, I mean, because she was wonderful. She was the highlight of the year to me. I'm sorry. You know, no, but then what happened? So and then I got her home to my kitchen this one time when she arrived on New Year's Eve, and I was planning a small party, and I said, Oh, if I would known you were coming, I would have had the kitchen floor scrubbed. And she said, I don't look at that. I only look to see if the people are She didn't expect the best bed of the house. She didn't get in anybody's way in the bathroom. She never got me away in the bathroom because she got up real early and took her shower and left. So to me, she was like family, the dearest family. Peace Pilgrim was also 
a yogi. You know, there's uh, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras is describes the real yoga. That uh, I was talking with the woman who uh, publishes LA Yoga Magazine up in LA, and she told me that the hot new thing in LA was a couple of years ago uh, was to get a yoga butt. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get <laughs> That's why, you know, they kept the sages kept these things secret for a long time for a reason. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's still good. And then Patanjali describes the, the rungs of yoga. And if you listen to these, they're the, the yamas and the niyamas. And they just totally describe peace pilgrim. The yamas are codes of restraint, abstinence, self-regulation that involve our relationship with the external world and with other people. And there's ahimsa, non-violence, non-harming, non-injury, satya, truthfulness, uh, honesty, uh, asteya, non-stealing, abstention from theft, brahmacharya, walking in the awareness of the highest reality, and continence and remembering the divine, practicing the presence of God, uh, aparigraha, non-possessiveness, non-holding through the senses, non-greed. So that's kind of a, her resume. <laughs> and then the five niyamas are deal more with your personal inner world. And there's shaucha, purity of body and mind. Santosha, contentment. Tapa, training the senses, and experiencing austerities. Svadhyaya, self-study, reflection. Ishwara pra Pranidhana, Surrender and practicing the presence of God, the surrender of the fruits of your practice, which she had to do because, you know, she was going and talking and talking for peace and getting these hundreds of articles, and then there's another war. I'm sure that was disappointing, but she didn't let that, uh, you know, stop her. And so some of the contrast, I want to share some of the contrast with her. You know, again, at the time, she wanted people to focus on her message and not you know, how she, not so much how she used to be or how her family was or how, you know, how her life was before being peace pilgrim. But now that she's gone, I think it's really uh, fascinating and to, it's inspiring to understand that we can also transform ourselves. And uh, one thing that made me feel good about including you know, some of the other facts about her pre-peace pilgrim story uh, is because uh, the Papa Ramdas, some of you may have heard of him, he's a very saintly, uh, he's gone now, but a saintly uh, Swami in India, at Ananda Ashram in South India, and his uh, disciple Swami Satchidananda was writing a book called The Gospel of uh, Swami Ramdas, that was kind of similar to the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna that some of you may have heard of or read, where it you know, tells about conversations he was having and the itinerary of the day and you know, different things happening around him. And when he asked uh, Papa Ramdas at one point, well, should I include this? People might you know, take it the wrong way. And he said, don't hide anything. Put everything in there. And um, so Peace Pilgrim's brother-in-law, Eugene, wrote this in a personal communication. He said, to those of us who knew Mildred in her youth and young maidenhood, the ascension to the role of peace pilgrim is all the more astounding. <laughs> her brother said the same thing. Her brother was like, well, it's not like she was an unsympathetic person, but, you know, we didn't expect her to do this. He said, uh, while Mildred's background was intellectual and moral, there was little evidence of the altruistic self-sacrificing traits so prominent in the personality of Peace Pilgrim. In order for her to become Peace Pilgrim, it was necessary for her to undergo a complete revision. This goes far to explain why so many of her family and former friends actually rejected her. She was no longer the Mildred they knew, and therefore beyond their comprehension. So the people didn't, they didn't go with her, the people who, you know, who knew her growing up. You know, you can't be a prophet in your hometown, they say. <laughs> so, um, and, but she was very good in school, and, you know, she actually started walking very late in childhood. Kind of interesting, intriguing, you know, these contrasts again. Um, she was very good in debate class, <laughs> and which she, I'm sure, came in handy while she was discussing peace with people. 
she was a great swimmer. She loved to go to the lake, and she was a real daredevil. She would do all kinds of, you know, dives that no one else would do. She also directed plays. So she was, and then she became, you know, she had a job at uh, a wine factory near Egg Harbor, and it was a very good job. And she, um, well, you can hear uh, her sister Helene is going to describe a little bit about how she was the most fashionable person in Egg Harbor. <laughs> And that's going to be number 10. And Helene is still alive today. She's 99 years old. And if anyone wants to go in September to Egg Harbor, New Jersey, they have an annual event, the Peace Pilgrim event, that Helene will be there. If somebody she's with us, which hopefully she will. She's very healthy. She rides her bike 10 miles a day. <laughs> so I guess runs in their family. <laughs> that kind of lets you know if Peace Pilgrim was still here today, she'd still be walking. And uh, so Helene's going to talk about her contrast. When I spoke to the jail up in Camden, I told the, the, the inmates there, you can make changes in your life. She started out very different from what she became. She was very much into fun. She was a party person too, you know. She was very much into material things. because She had all of her clothes made. She designed them the way she wanted them and she would take her shoes and things to Atlantic City to be dyed, get everything to match her outfits. She always had to have her clothes match uh, perfectly. There was a lot of pictures of it. She'd pose, uh, you know, like Greta Garbo. <laughs> and then she ended up wearing just a tunic for the rest of her life, a tunic and pants. And she had a bathing suit under it. So that's how she could wash her clothes. And then um, she would just, you know, bathe in, in that. That's how she was often kind of over. She would stay at someone's house and get to use their shower. Uh, this is a fun story she told. She, she was kind of critical of Christians sometimes, because at the <laughs> time I think most people in the country were considered Christians. And I think she saw a little bit of uh, maybe a little hypocrisy there. And so she was, she, she said well, once a college student once asked me if I had ever been mugged. Mugged, I answer. You would have to be a crazy person to mug me. I haven't a penny to my name. <laughs> She said, there was a time when I was walking out of town at sunset, and a well-to-do couple in a big house called me over. They had read about my pilgrimage and felt it was their Christian duty to warn me that ahead on the way lay a very wicked place called South of the Border. They just wanted to warn me not to go near that place. They did not offer food or shelter, however, so I walked on for several hours. It was a very dark night with a heavy cloud cover, and all of a sudden it started to rain. Big drops were coming down, and I was carrying a lot of unanswered mail. I looked for a place where there might be a shelter, and nearby I saw a combination gas station, restaurant, and motel. I ducked under the roof over the gas pumps and started to put the unanswered mail into the front of my tunic so it wouldn't get wet. The man from the gas station came running out and said, don't stand out there in the rain, come into the restaurant. The man in the restaurant said, oh, we read all about you, and we would like to offer you a dinner or anything you want. By that time, I realized where I was. I was in <laughs> south of the border. <laughs> the man from the motel was sitting across the table from me, and he gave me a room for the night. They also gave me breakfast the next morning. There may have been some gambling in the back room. Something was going on there. But they treated me in a much more Christian fashion than those who warned me against them. It just demonstrates my point that there is good in everybody. <coughs> I'm sure even in the Christian people who said that. <laughs> and at one point, she, she would explain that, she would talk about living at need level. It's a very interesting topic, especially for today, with econ economic ups and downs, things like that, and just with, you know, wanting to become free. 
Uh, she said, I was determined to li live at the need level. That is, I didn't want more than I need when so many have less than they need. And I can really relate to that. Um, you know, in a way, I've, I've had a, a low income time. I've had friends tell me, stop focusing on Peace Pilgrim. <laughs> because I like to give also, and I don't like to charge, and, and things like that. Uh, and part of that is, I couldn't imagine having a lot of money and knowing how many people are in need. Uh, it would just feel, you know, again, it's that inner dharma you feel. You want, you know, it's, it's almost easier to have less. And I think, I think that's what she was talking about. And, but she would say, find the need level for you, which obviously if you have a family, it should, you know, you need a home. If you're, you know, I'm working, I'm writing, I need a home to live in, things like that. Um, but she didn't, she didn't want uh, more than, she said, what I want and what I need are exactly the same. She said, you couldn't give me anything I don't need. And in clip number 11, Aline uh, talks about how she didn't accept more than she needed. She followed her bliss. Her bliss was going on no matter what it took to, co to, to fulfill her destiny. And her destiny was to go out there and touch as many people in, a, in not a pushy way. She was, didn't have anything to sell, you know, and she wasn't, I mean, you know. And all people were kind of amazed at that. Well, where do we send contributions and where do we do that? And that was a hard thing to find out back in those days. And uh, she only carried a, she carried a ballpoint pen, and I gave her stamps. And when she only asked me, and I said, oh, I have a lot of stamps. She said, oh, I need three stamps. I mean, like, I don't need a dozen stamps. I need three stamps. Extra fourth stamp would be a burden, you know. Where am I going to put it? It'll get damp in my pocket or something, you know. And golly, uh, I wish I had learned more for her in that direction. I have too many things, you know. We all do. Swami Vivekananda, again in harmony with that, says, In human society, too much wealth or too much poverty is a great impediment to the higher development of the soul. And what Peace Pilgrim had wasn't poverty because her, her needs were met. Mm -hmm. She just had simple needs, and she had the power of living in faith. You know, there's another Sufi song I love uh, that says, Why should I beg for anything from anyone? My Lord, you give me everything with your unseen hand. Mm -hmm. I'll sing that line because I really love it. Magum like young kisi se koi de ga kya muche de tahe das te gai basse mera kuda muche. Someone asked her, Do you work for a living? She said, I work for my living in an unusual way. I give what I can through thoughts and words and deeds to those whose lives I touch and to humanity. In return, I accept what people want to give, but I do not ask. They are blessed by their giving, and I am blessed by my giving. Now, of course, there were doubters. You know, but she, they had their part in the play, and I'm sure she loved the doubters very much also. And uh, she said, of course I love everyone I meet. How could I fail to? Within everyone is the spark of God. I am not concerned with racial or ethnic background or the color of one's skin. All people look to me like shining lights. And I think that's exactly what she experienced, you know, and that's how she treated everybody. Um, and, you know, Ramakrishna had a quote about these doubters, these troublemakers. He said, the, the play is enlivened by the presence of troublemakers. They are necessary to lend zest to the play. There is no fun without them. <laughs> and uh, I used that quote for my memoir chapter called Nemesis. <laughs> about uh, George. Yeah, oh, someone who knows. <laughs> There's someone who knew him <laughs> from the ashram. Uh, who we also loved very much, but, you know, he was a troublemaker in that regard. And Mr. Shehab, Mrs. Shehab's husband, uh, he was a, he's very curmudgeon, <laughs> curmudgeonly about it, but in a very cute way. And uh, 
you know, his wife says in the middle of this clip that, well, it's because, she, you know, she, he's upset because she was a woman and she ate, her, ate, ate his food and slept in his house. And I'm sure she, she was really upset that she got his wife to become more powerful in her own right. Um, but you see kind of how he's, uh, he's trying to bring down what she did. And that's uh, in clip number 12. I was very happy to find this. It was <laughs> I think uh, I think it's an easy way of making a living. Oh, it wasn't making a living. Uh, easy way of living then. But they don't have to tell me that while they are saying, but send me a thousand dollars while you're listening to me. And you have this in California. And she never accepted money. Uh, you know, well, what's money? She accepted things that money would buy. She accepted food, she accepted lodging, she accepted transportation, she accepted stamps. So if, uh, if I go to a newspaper and say, we will pay you all these things if you work for us, we will give you enough food every month, we'll give you a house to live in, we'll give you a car, we'll give you the gas for the car, we'll give you stamps, and so on, you don't have to report it for taxes. I'd rather do that than get a salary. She was a woman. Eating his food, living in somebody's bed. It was that simple. She disturbed the routine of the household. Well, you didn't get dinner on time. Oh, he did. He now he got a better dinner too many times. You know, you put on a little extra for company, so you do a little extra special. You don't eat in the kitchen. You eat in the dining room. He got his meals on time. So what irritated you about Peace Her uh, style of living and her obsession with herself. She was really obsessed with Peace Pilgrim. She thought she was the center of everything. That really irritated me a lot. When I heard her call the newspaper and say, now I am the lady in this blue uniform that says Peace Pilgrim and I walked so many thousand of miles, now send somebody to interview me. I always found that very strange. I think she said, maybe you would like to interview me. She didn't order them to send somebody to interview her. Of course, whenever she got interviewed and she was in our house, I was the driver. <laughs> so you can see how she must have loved him. <laughs> and he still hosted her. You know, so she didn't let that bring her down. And she, like I said, she was like a one-person PR team. She just would call ahead for the next place and arrange uh, for articles and things like that because she wanted to get her message out. So you say it's self-centered, you know, it's self-centered, the big self, mm. you know, and she's just, that's her role and that's her job to do. <clears throat> uh, she won many doubters over. And one example is Ted Hayes. He was the manager of a small radio station in Knox, Indiana. And in uh, number 13, he will talk about how he was resistant to meeting peace. And then we'll go into 14 after that. I was fairly hard bitten in those days. Um, I was um, wedded to the clock. Um, I remember when the secretary said to me what she was there for, um, there was a frustration and irritation on my part of, oh my lord, no, um, you know, because it was going to throw the whole, it was going to back the whole day up. Um, now, I don't want this to be done for dramatics and effect, but it was almost where Jesus selected the uh, disciples, they weren't like him. Uh, but I was frustrated by having to do that interview. I had no interest in it. I had no background with it. And uh, my first thought was, let's get her in and get her out and uh, get moving. Uh, but then she attached. <laughs> on another level, you know, not the uh, 
not the level that I was on when I first came in contact with her. And when I said nut, kook, um, that's probably how I, uh, I regarded her. And, uh, um, you know, one that would not further my life or my profession in any way for that day or for eternity. But she attaches real fast. And uh, when you reminded me, Claire, that uh, her uh, credo was, uh, all people are good. I think she knew that. She reached right into your gut and <laughs> pulled that out of you. Uh, pulled that genuineness out of you. Now, I don't know that uh, it was so inspiring that I've, uh, I've become a different person. Uh, I think a lot of things have come into my life to allow me to become more mellow and I think a lot of it's just age, but uh, uh, for that one shining moment, she, uh, she brought that out. Yeah, Ted actually uh, interviewed her a day before she passed. Wow. Uh, so we can see, we can see 14 also. Do you remember what your first impression was of her? Skepticism. Uh, yeah. I hadn't seen very many people in those tunics. Something written on it would be reminiscent of a flag man on a highway construction program that has a slow or, or something on his tunic. Um, but from the moment she opened her mouth, you knew that she was non-threatening. Uh, you realized that uh, she was, as I said before, genuine, that it, it wasn't something that was put on or made up. Uh, she was, uh, she, she very rapidly tore down the barriers. Um, I think from the moment we started talking, uh, I attached to her in some way. So I read after I prepared this clip, I was looking on uh, the web at some news reports and I saw a picture of uh, police somewhere and they had the blue tops with the white print on the back, police and the department they were from. <laughs> and I, well, I guess that's what he was talking about. That's what most people are used to. And she also understood esoteric wisdom. I wasn't sure whether to bring this, but we're in Encinitas, so we can, we can handle this. <laughs> um, so here's a clip, number 16, of uh, what she said when she first met Richard Billings. And she walked into the center, our Unity Center in East Lansing, and started telling me about herself, and I had never heard of her before. And uh, then she said to me, don't you remember me? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I was your teacher in Lemuria. And I said, well, if you were, that's wonderful. <laughs> and we, we had a lot of fun about that. And then she stayed with me there and spoke to our group and spent about three days there with us in East Lansing and uh, talked and met the people. And, uh, and then she said, I've got to be on my way. I was driving to Kalamazoo and I said, can I take you to Kalamazoo? And she said, no, I'm walking. That's what I'm all about, walking for peace. peace. <laughs> <laughs> and let's play number 17 also. This is Ted Hayes talking about her eyes. Oh, her eyes were penetrating. She had beautiful blue eyes. Um, Peace Pilgrim was not uh, um, a gorgeous woman. She was, uh, uh, you know, even a bit disheveled. Uh, but she had eyes that just stood out. Uh, I referred to them before as Paul Newman, uh, Robert Redford type eyes. <laughs> and uh, they're eyes that you don't forget. They're the type eyes that people uh, attempt to uh, uh, have today with contact lenses. They were the type eyes that you would be attracted to. That would be the feature of uh, 
uh, and I just about called her Mildred, that would be the uh, feature of Peace Pilgrim that you would be drawn to. Interesting, yeah. So she was kind of disheveled. It, I noticed in some of the uh, newspaper photos that she had some makeup on. Now, of course, she didn't carry makeup with her, so I could just, I know those people, because <laughs> I don't wear makeup either, and they're the ones, oh, let me just put a little, <laughs> can, I have, can we put together an outfit for you? <laughs> so I'm sure they put some makeup on her, so no, people will be able to accept your message better if you have some lipstick on. <laughs> um, and um, she talked about problems. She said, uh, someone asked her, will there always be pain and one's becoming more beautiful? And she said, there will be pain in your spiritual growth until you will to do God's will and no longer need to be pushed into it. When you are out of harmony with God's will, problems come. Their purpose is to push you into harmony. If you would willingly do God's will, you could avoid the problems. Uh, then she also says, there was a time when I thought it was a nuisance to be confronted with a problem. I tried to get rid of it. I tried to get somebody else to solve it for me. But that time was long ago. It was a great day in my life when I discovered the wonderful purpose of problems. Yes, they have a wonderful purpose. Some people wish for a life of no problems, but I would never wish such a life for any of you. What I wish for you is the great inner strength to solve your problems meaningfully and grow. Problems are learning and growing experiences. A life without problems would be a barren existence without the opportunity for spiritual growth. And of course that resonates with uh, some of the gospel songs. You know, the way may not be easy. You didn't say, Lord, that it would be. But when our tribulations are too light, we tend to stray from thee. Oh, have mercy, Lord, don't move the mountain. Just give me strength to climb. Lord, don't move my stumbling blocks. Me around. So I, I sang that on the CD that comes with Spirituality for Dummies because that teaching was so important uh, and helped me go through problems. And uh, I was just singing it all year while I was getting ready to record the, record the CD. And I was singing it in the car and I was just singing it all the time. And all of a sudden, mountains of problems showed up. Like, I couldn't even, I mean, unbearable. Too many, just problems with, with the book, problems with so many things. And uh, I had creditors calling while I was writing Spirituality for Dummies like ten times a day. And it was just, you know, everything was challenging, challenging, challenging. And so, and, and yet that song kept going. <laughs> and I realized, you have to be careful what you're running through your mind. And I started, when it was coming up, I would start changing it to, Lord, it's okay to move some of those mountains. <laughs> and uh, of course, we can also cause ourselves problems. Here's another clip I wasn't sure whether to bring. It's number 18, where Aline tries to shock <coughs> Peace Pilgrim. Because why not, right? <laughs> I'm curious about everything, and I asked her, I said, uh, uh, in fact, I made the mistake of asking her in the company of the Theosophical Society meeting. I mean, I do that anyway. I, I, I'm psychic, and I can feel around the room people are dying to say something just shocking, you know. And I said, well, Peace, I said, what about, I said, I have a friend, and he has teenage kids, and I said, and he didn't know what they were going, what was going on in their life. I said, I took him to an X-rated movie, so he would know something about that. So she said, ah! Oh! She said, stay away from those places. She said, the entities just swarm to those places. I said, I know. That's exactly what we said. We didn't care about the actually uh, the graphics that we saw because being adult people, that, you know, actually what was going on there was either uh, repulsive and, and like that. But what, came, what was worse, we both came out and we said, we feel like 
like we want to be wiped off. We may feel like, ew, like you're crawling with something. Like, like. And she said, that's exactly right, and it's a good thing. She said, if I would have been there, I would have scrubbed you down. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Peace of Pilgrim's message. This is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good, falseness, falsehood with truth, and hatred with love. And, of course, overcoming evil with good, there's so many ways to apply it in our lives. Even for me, like if I'm driving and the uh, driver acts like an idiot, and I think, oh, what an idiot, I try to think of something positive to balance that out. Oh, look, that's a good driver. <laughs> just something. Just because you want to overcome any evil, you want to find something good uh, to balance it out. And, uh, you know, even just this week, there's a news story about, uh, again, Korea's back in the headlines, North Korea. There's a movie where it's a comedy and they're told to assassinate uh, the head of North Korea. And, uh, you know, he got mad about it. And, and not, I mean, rightly so, really. I wouldn't really want to see a, a comedy from another country where they're trying to assassinate our president. It's kind of, you know. Um, and he's, you know, so he's declared it an act of war. And said that you know President Obama should stop the movie from being released, and so there's you know overcome evil with good. I, I was thinking one good way to approach it would be let's say President Obama or whomever were to communicate with this head of state uh, and Kim Jong Un, right? and and explain how democracy works and say look I I don't think it's a great movie either I don't think. You know, I don't think it's great to have a comedy about assassinating a head of state, but in this country, I'm not allowed to tell them that they can't show it. And I thought that would be an interesting way to bring some good into it, to teach him something about democracy. And of course, overcoming hatred with love, the easiest way is to see the bigger picture of the universe. Um, see, it's all divine. It's all a karmic play. There are lessons to learn. There's, there's a universal guru teaching us through everybody. So then you don't have to hate anybody. You can, you know, address it if someone's doing something wrong and you need to tell somebody or do something about it, then you can still do it with love. Love for the world, you know, and for the person, you know. And then, uh, sometimes, my, my guru once said, you know, sometimes in life an enemy becomes a friend and a friend becomes an enemy. So, um, then I, I wanted to show you a clip, we're going to end very soon, I wanted to show you a clip of how Peace Pilgrim passed. Because it's very interesting. Um, after she counted those 25,000 miles, she would accept rides, because sometimes she'd have many events scheduled in one day, so she can't walk, you know, within an hour or half hour from one church to another. I heard that one day she had seven events in the same day. So she would let her host, you know, would drive her. And uh, there's a couple interesting things uh, that aren't shared uh, in this clip. And one of them is that when she first walked out that morning, she exclaimed to her host, she looked around and she said, oh, it's full of angels. And that was right before she passed. So this is number 19. Do you think the world is more at peace now because of your efforts? Well, I, of course, only the world is more at peace because of the efforts of all peacemakers put together. Uh, you see, when I started out, why people accepted war as a necessary part of life, but now I'm on the popular side because peace has become a matter of survival, and even the most immature people wish to survive. In my frame of reference, I'm not the body. I'm only wearing the body. I'm that which activates the body. That's the reality. Now, if I am killed, it destroys merely the body, which is transient anyway. That last night she was here, she did what many people felt was a wonderful healing experience. And many people noticed that. She kept looking up during her talk with the people. And finally, she just came down the steps and 
and started moving around through the congregation that was there and she just would reach out and just touch people and say bless you and go to the next and all. Walked around and there wasn't a sound in the room. And when it was all over, she walked back up and she looked up again and she said, I never say goodbye, but this has been a very special night for me and I just want to bless all of you and, and I'll be seeing you. And many, many people came to me and said, you know, she looked very different, but what was she looking at? The night before that, she and I had sat for a long time and just talked, and she had never talked about death before, well, ne neither one of us had. And she said, you know, I want you to join me in prayer. This is really what I want to ask of you tonight, that when my work here on this planet Earth is done, that I move out like that, that I go very quickly. Well, I got a phone call from my husband uh, at work. And he came to pick me up. And of course, it was a shock. I just didn't think that. I had no, I just always felt that she was going to outlive me. Blessed are those who bring peace. It was a beautiful ceremony down at the Methodist Church. And they had asked us to speak for just a few minutes. And I remember I spoke longer than that because I had interviewed her. And I had so much that I, I, I wanted to share. And I don't know how long I talked. But I think it was longer than five minutes. And no one seemed to mind because we were just grieving. I celebrated when she died, the way she died, because she lived in character, and she certainly was a character who did her own thing and believed in it. And she died on the road. She died the way she lived. That was a big blessing. That was a blessing from the heavens. Oh. The people who owned the house were very wealthy. Which was a young woman driving, putting makeup on, oh. and she ran into their car. Oh. <clears throat> it was really interesting to find her. <laughs> she she made it through, <clears throat> and um, the uh, fellow who lived in that house told a story um, that when uh, about a year before that, he was inspired to build a huge pyramid on his front lawn. And it was completely bizarre. They were kind of rednecky, you know. They were not into esoteric things like that. But he had this guidance, and he built, spent a long time building this huge pyramid in front of uh, the house. And um, he felt that he was meant to do that. That it somehow helped her to go to uh, another plane. So um, that's basically uh, the talk. We do have a six-minute clip of the whole video, but you can also see it on my website. So it's up to it's up to Vinaya. <laughs> I am a pilgrim, a wanderer, and a pilgrim is a wanderer with a purpose. A pilgrimage can be either to a place 
or for a thing. And mine is for a thing. Mine is for peace. She has optimism to have faith and then to step out on that faith. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's inspiring and enheartening. I think the truth of a person's influence stems more from the degree to which they're anchored in the universal truth of life, the, the great truth the, of all of our lives. And she, Peace Program, was. She was a living demonstration of the potential that can be unleashed when persons are fully engaged in doing what they believe to be the most important thing in the world. She spoke of peace in a time of war. My vow says I shall remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. Now, I am praying for peace in the world, even though I talk mostly about peace within ourselves as a step toward peace in our world. You don't have to be good at arithmetic to figure out that if the nations of the world were to stop manufacturing implements of mass destruction, they could provide for every human being who lives in this world the basis for a very good life. She spoke of universal spirituality before spirituality was in vogue. Aren't they beautiful? I touched God many times as truth. All that intellectually and emotionally, I touched God as love and goodness and kindness and beauty. I felt God through the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. And then reaching out through an awakened divine nature, I was able to perceive God as the ever-present, all-pervading essence or spirit, which binds everything in the universe together and gives life to everything in the universe. I learned from Peace to do what I call dialoguing with God because she told me, Richard, I have the most wonderful dialogues with God. Sometimes I really argue with Him, sometimes I get mad at Him, and once in a while we have a real peaceful conversation. <laughs> She took a vow to walk penniless until mankind had learned peace. This is a real pilgrimage. It's actually a journey on foot. I don't hitchhike. I walk in spite of all the rides that are offered and on faith. I took a vow at the beginning that I would remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace. Walking until I am given shelter, and fasting until I am given food. And although I have never asked for anything, I can truthfully say that I have been supplied. She called herself Peace Pilgrim. began January 1st of 1953. It's my retirement project, and I finished counting the 25,000 miles toward the end of 1964. I have not counted miles since then. Well, is it uh, very often that you have to go without food or without a bed on these walks? 
I seldom skip more than three or four meals in a row. I don't even think about food until food is offered. I once had a 45-day period of prayer and fasting. I know how long one can go without food. And even when I'm with total strangers, I have a bed about three quarters of the time. When I don't, I might sleep in a bus station in a city or a truck stop out on the highway. But I have slept on the grass beside the road. I have walked all night to keep warm. If you're concerned enough about what you're doing, you don't mind any of these little so-called hardships. And I'm very concerned about peace. So um, you made a documentary about her? Yes. They, they actually sent me, well, there was a whole thing went on. Somebody had said they were going to do a documentary and didn't quite do it. And, and it took all their money. <laughs> so the, that's when they came to me, of course. <laughs> and they were out of money. But, um, and they sent me um, over 200 hours of footage. So it was really powerful because I, you know, I contemplated what would she want to say. It was very guided. And once I got that first five minutes done, I knew it was going to be great. And uh, there was a lot of footage to go through and a lot of long interviews, including her husband, her ex-husband, who you could really see how they weren't very compatible, you know. It was hard to watch him because of, and then, but except I got the payoff line <laughs> when he said, uh, well, she just wasn't a homemaker. No way, shape, or form was she a homemaker, and that's what I wanted. So you'll hear in the video, I included, I was like, yay, that was worth it now, and I did a little rim shot and the music right before that. <laughs> so if yours is a documentary, and the one that's coming out is like a Hollywood type movie? Yeah, it'll be a movie, and um, I'll tell you, I'm not sure if I, I'll, I'll bleep the, the actress's name out of the video if I'm not allowed to say who is going to be playing her. Um, the fellow writing the script, he was very insistent it had to be Meryl Streep, but she, she wasn't getting back to him. <laughs> oh, really? Well, she, of course, Meryl Streep would be, um, you know, great at playing any role, but then, um, but it, he, was, he wasn't able to get, get into her, and it just wasn't happening. And uh, one day, I, I was sitting in the morning, I was watching Good Morning America, and I about fell off my chair, because I saw who should play Peace Cobra. And it was, you gonna wait before you leave to hear the name? <laughs> it was Sissy Spacek. I was just thinking of that. You were? I was. It oh, just came to my mind. Very good. So I, I had to work on Mark for a while to get him to release you know, Meryl, we had a little, we had a little, you know, uh, survey on his Facebook page, or I'm trying to drum up you know, support for uh, Sissy, and then I um, asked him, I said I could write her a letter and send her the documentary, and he said, yes, please do, he's a great guy, very open, very, you know, he's, he's really in the right space to do a peace building project. And I sent her a very nicely crafted two-page letter and a copy of the documentary, and included a copy of my book, Spirituality for Dummies, to introduce myself. And a month later, phone rings. Hi, this is Sissy Spacek's manager. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? And she said, uh, Sissy loved your letter. She loved the documentary. She's absolutely interested in this role. And she said, now let me say this three times, because she told me to say it over and over till you get it. More than all those things, she loved your book. <laughs> she dog-eared every other page you've put into words, everything she believes. So that was a sweet treat back. Yeah. And uh, then I connected her with Mark, with the director, and they had a long discussion, a couple hours. And uh, she's absolutely on board, but she has uh, she had another project, a movie, to do first, which should be ending soon. And she, she even asked if she could touch up the script and add a few more human elements, and that's a good sign. And uh, she asked him, well, who do you want to direct it? He said, well, I wish I could get it to Ron Howard. Oh. Right, Forrest Gump? Yeah. And many, you know, many movies, and he has such a good heart. And she said, oh, he's a dear friend. He's like family. I just played his daughter's mother in The Help. <laughs> so hopefully, we don't know. Nothing's, uh, nothing's signed you know, or anything like that, but um, that's looking pretty wonderful if that could happen. And, 
you know, I think a lot of, even Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein, who's made a lot of violent movies, he wants to make more positive movies. He's doing The Alchemist right now. So, God willing, and hopefully this gathering will be a, a little spark for that, and whoever gets to watch it, you know. <coughs> <laughs> if you want to get Kuja's book, she's leaving her cards up there. If you take a card and go on Amazon, you can you can My books are on Amazon. I have audio books also. And take if you, but do take a card because I have uh, my little service is a website with hundreds of pages. It's all free with videos, music, books. You can spend weeks. When you walked in here, you were hearing her singing the Guru Gita. That was her, she, it's an hour long singing of this very ancient Sanskrit prayer. Mm -hmm. And that was what she said. That was, that when you was walked in here, that was her singing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, play it on my website. And it's also, if anyone's read the book Eat, Pray, Love, this is the chant that she writes about that she was resistant about going to. and. Uh, because I lived, that was my ashram that I lived in. Yes? Are you writing the music to this? I mean, you sing, obviously, but do you write? Are you doing the music to this documentary? Um, well, the documentary is completed are you already. To the movie that you're doing? Oh, I doubt it'll be bigger than that. But who knows? You know, maybe I'll have something to contribute. But, I'm, you know. See, I, again, I don't have any expectation of what's going to come back to me from helping to get this movie going. Although I did cast the lead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Mark's very generous. He's, uh, you know, he's like, You'll, you're in the credits anyway, regardless of what happens. So, you know, what, whatever happens, I'm just really happy to, I love to help create great things. You know, that's what I learned in the ashram. I made uh, hundreds of videos about spiritual wisdom and about my gurus and sent them around the world. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what gives me joy. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was on the flyer, but it said something about uh, this program uh, that she started off with a certain type of faith, and then her faith changed. Is kind of what I thought it was saying. Is that I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so. Okay. I'm sure her faith grew as she walked. I'm sure every experience, you know, she tells. You know, she tells stories. She was caught in a snowstorm once and couldn't. Oh and thought she was going to die. She was walking, and she was way out on the boonies, and there was no place around, and it was freezing cold, and her hands were getting frozen and everything, and she, and she thought she was dying. She couldn't even see in front of her. That's how huge a snowstorm it was. And then she saw in the distance a bridge, and she thought, well, I'll go sit under the bridge. And under the bridge, she found a huge box filled with wrapping paper, and she tucked herself in. She could hardly move her fingers, but she tucked herself in, and uh, the next morning she woke up and it was sunny again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her book is really interesting because she does do, you know, she has all the kind of fears that you would imagine. She explains that that happened. You know, yes, people did think about attacking her. And, and she did. Shows how she used her faith and somehow got through it all. And that mm -hmm. That's right. She was always protected. You know, one guy picked her up on the side of the road and, you know, again, it was bad weather. and. You know, he just had her, she was in the truck, and at one point he offered her a uh, bologna sandwich, and she took the bread. <laughs> she didn't eat the bologna. And then he said, well, why don't you just have, you know, have some sleep? And then the next morning she woke up, he was sitting outside of the car, and she went over to him, and he said, I have to tell you, my intentions were not good last night, what I was going to do. He said, but I just saw you sleeping so trusting and so peacefully, I couldn't do anything. Things like that. Yeah. So, and her book is so wonderful. Her friends gathered together her teachings, and you know, she often told the same stories and the same teachings. Um, I think it was in part, in part because it explained what she had to say, and she was talking to different people. But also, she didn't want disciples following her. You know, she wanted people would ask, "Can I walk with you?" She'd say, "You know, you can walk for a mile with me." But she had to walk on her own. She didn't want to have a group of. Uh, people following her. In fact, at one point they went up to Alaska for a camping retreat. And, uh, and they, you know, they, they hadn't, hadn't arranged a place uh, to sleep. And she said, you know, you, you can't do this on my faith, you know. <laughs> you can do it on your faith or you can arrange for a place where everyone can sleep. But, you, you know, you can't do it, it doesn't work that way to do it on my faith. <laughs> So, and then we have Kalea. 
Hi, uh, I haven't seen you in a long time. Thank you. So thank you all so much. What a wonderful <laughs> House and we have all these wonderful refreshments and yeah, chai. Yeah, you yourself on the way out. If you want some oh, chai, stay up a little later to tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it does okay. Thank you. That's